Well, good morning, everyone. So, so happy to be here and see your lovely faces. That's why we're here to fellowship. Good morning to you at home as well. Thank you for tuning in. I know I have some families in St. Vincent that are tuning in this morning. So I'm very excited that we're all here to fellowship. You know, like, I'm very grateful to be here. And I'm really hoping that you're very grateful to be here as well. Just to be here for this moment, or even an hour, or whatever time we spend together is a blessing. So let's give God thanks. And before we do that, I would just like to share a word of scripture for you. And um, I'm reading from John chapter 16 and verse 12. And it says, I still have many things to tell you, but you can't bear them now. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own, but he will speak whatever he hears. He will also declare to you what is to come. Um, I just have a little testimony to share with you. For the past three months, I, I really had a difficult time. I went through a really, really, really dark time in my life. And that was around the time where I heard the voice of the Spirit saying to pack those barrels. Um, and this comes upon me in the form of emotions. Um, it was just something that I heard and it just triggered me off. And it was like emotions of hurt, it was disappointment, it was frustration. And to top it off, the worst of all was anger. And anger was something that I, I deal with, I was struggling with for a while, but God has been helping me. But you know what, on top of that, I knew I was hearing the voice of the Spirit. I was struggling here, but I still hear the voice of the Spirit because I keep hearing scripture. I keep hearing a thing that one wise woman told me. She said, feelings are real, but they're not always true. So I was just struggling with that. But you know, at the end of the day, I know God was with me because we never stop meeting in devotions. We never stop worshiping during the week. We, I was just crying out to the Lord all the time. And I just want to read something from my um, diary that I wrote so you can know what I came through and how I came through. Um, this spirit of affliction had provided me with abundant opportunity for self-examination, and I recognize myself as a sinner. Nevertheless, I will wait expectantly and patiently for the Lord to act on my behalf. And it was um, a voice from my little Cody that really made everything click. And I realized the Holy Spirit never left me. He has always been talking to me. He has always been comforting me. He has always been soothing me. So this morning, I am here passionately to praise the Lord. I am here to give him thanks for he is good and he will always be good. So let's join with me in worship. These songs are very familiar with you guys, so you can just join with me. When I look into your holiness, when I gaze into your loveliness, when all things that surround become shadows in the light of you. When I found the joy of reaching your heart, when my will becomes enthroned in your love, when all things that surround become shadows in the light of you.
I think that round of applause is for the Lord. Amen. He is good. He is good. He's the reason why we live.
we do lift up the name of Jesus because you have said in your word that if I will be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. And this morning we gather in your name to say, Lord, thank you. Thank you for sending your son. Thank you for leaving your spirit. Oh God, I pray that you will bless every moment that we spend here together. Bless your word unto our soul, Lord Jesus. Give us ears to hear what you have to say. Give us a heart to accept your truth, Lord, and give us a willingness to live it out. And God, we will give you praise and glory all the days of our lives. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You. Thank you, Karen. Thank you, worship team, the Edmondson family. What a great blessing they are to us as a church and to see them using 
the gifts that God has given them to honor God's name. So we thank God for you this morning and leading us in that time of worship. Uh, we are uh, going to continue in our series today, but before we do, I just want to say a thank you to you as a congregation uh, for your great prayers of our family. Um, Morgan is good. Praise the Lord. And uh, it's hard to put words into, into place when your 20-year-old has a stroke. Uh, but the Lord brought her through it uh, without serious medical treatment uh, in the hospital. Uh, God provided for her, and so we are so thankful uh, that she is home now, and she's recovering, and she's trying to endure Lisa and I hovering over her because we don't want her out of our sight right now, uh, but she's doing well, and, uh, and we'll be having some several appointments uh, coming up this upcoming week to kind of determine what happened, because we still don't know what happened. Only the Lord knows, but God brought her through, and we are faithful, uh, and he is faithful to bring her through whatever uh, will come, so we thank him for that. But we are going to continue in our, our series this morning on You Asked For It, and I do believe that this was intended for this morning because it came through a, a bunch of different ways, a bunch of different directions. Um, you know, through a Bible study group with the young people online, uh, we looked at this passage a couple weeks ago, and I thought, oh, hmm, God got my attention with it. And then I was listening to a radio broadcast on driving around this week, um, I don't know, on 99.5, and they were, same thing, talking about, so I thought, okay, so this is something that we do need to, to talk about. And it was a great question that somebody asked. And the question was, what does it mean to grieve the Holy Spirit, and what kind of implications are involved in grieving the Holy Spirit? So I'm going to invite you to turn in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 4, please. Turn in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 4. And we will be looking, starting at verse 17, and I'll be reading through till verse 32. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 17 to 32. Ephesians 4, 17. So I tell you this, and insist on it in the Lord, that you must no longer live as Gentiles do, as unbelievers do, in the futility of their thinking. They are darkened by the, in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. Having lost all sensitivity, they have given themselves over to sensuality so as to indulge in any kind of impurity with a continual lust for more. You, however, did not come to know Christ that way. Surely you heard of him and were taught in him accordance with the truth that is in Jesus. You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds and to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to his neighbor, for we are all members of one body. In your anger, do not sin, and do not let the sun go down while you are still angry, and do not give the devil a foothold. He who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work doing something useful with his own hands, that he may have something to share with those in need. Do not let the unwholesome talk come from your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it might benefit those who listen. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. Let's give God thanks for his word to us this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your word, and your word brings uh, breath to our lungs, it brings life to our bones, God. Your presence in your spoken word, your presence in Jesus, the living word, uh, the presence, God, that we see as we encounter your word, God, can change and transform us. So, Lord, this morning we pray that you will shine your light in the, the dark places of our lives, God, that you will reveal the places that we hold back from you, Lord, and that you will challenge us to surrender ourselves completely to your purpose. Bless us, God, this morning as we gather in your name, in your word, singing praise to you, glorifying our Father in heaven. 
And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So we're going to be talking about grieving this morning. I'm thinking back to probably the earlier experiences of grieving in our family. When the girls were really little, um, we used to have, I don't know whether it was because I'm a, pastor's, a pastor in the family or whether it is because our kids were expecting it, but any time that there was an animal that died in our possession, we had a little ceremony, a little service for it in the backyard, okay? So, I mean, we're talking about a bird hits the window. We've got to have a ceremony, you know? We're talking about, like, the goldfish in the pond, the feeder goldfish, 25-cent goldfish in the pond. Got to have a ceremony for the goldfish. The hermit crabs that didn't last long in the Stewart household, we had to have ceremonies for them. And I can remember back in the time when probably Morgan was about three or four years old, Alexander was like seven or eight, and we were getting some work done in the backyard. And uh, so there was some workmen, construction guys there, and they were measuring out stuff to what they were going to do, build a patio in the backyard for us. And, and, and we had these construction guys working on one side of us, but that morning before they came, an animal in our family died. I can't even remember which one it was. It wasn't super significant, obviously, to me, but for our girls, it was the world. So we had a ceremony off to one side of like 20 feet away from where the guys are doing all the construction work. We had a little ceremony for the animal that died. And I can just remember how ironic or funny it kind of was to have like construction going on in one place. And then on the other hand, you've got this little ceremony happening. And what those guys must be thinking of us would be something else, I'm sure. But we felt it was always important for us to recognize the lives that God has given to us whether it's an animal, whether it's a fish, whether it's a bird, whatever. Life has been created by God and is precious to God. And so any time a life has passed, we feel we need to have a little ceremony, you know, to, to make the significance and recognize the gift that God has given in that life. Many of us, if we think about it, have gone through grief of one kind or another. It doesn't always have to be with the loss of a life. It can be grief of a family member, broken relationship. It can be grief for many different ways. When we look at the word grief in the Bible, actually, it, the grief really means this. It means intense sorrow, sadness, or distress. And the actual word grief is used here, also is used in these other examples in Matthew's Gospel, for example, when, disciples, when the disciples are grieving over the notice that Jesus has just given them in chapter 17, that he is going to die. They were grieving, even though he hadn't passed yet. In Matthew chapter 19, when the rich young man comes to Jesus saying, what must I do to be saved? He leaves unwilling to follow Jesus' command, and he leaves grieving because he has not been able to meet the requirement of God. In Matthew chapter 26, the disciples again are grieving over Jesus, this time because he was betrayed by Judas. Same word, grief, in Matthew 26, 22. In Matthew 26, again, in verse 37, when Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane, he is deeply sorrowful. Same word as we find here in verse 30. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit. Same word. Jesus was in intense sorrow and distress. In John chapter 16, the disciples, when, he, when Jesus was telling the disciples that he would be leaving them, he knew they would be in distress, and the word is the same word for grief. So grief is a common theme that runs throughout the scriptures. We need to recognize it. Sorrow is a part of, of, of life, and we need to recognize it as a part of life, but it is not supposed to be a part of the Christian life in terms of the Holy Spirit. Okay, Grieving on one hand does a wonderful thing. On one hand, it affirms the personality of the Holy Spirit. I know Pastor Rob, over the last two weeks, has been speaking wonderfully about the Trinity and the personalities within the Trinity and how they each function within the Trinity. And the Holy Spirit has a personality. He is not just some force. He's not just some kind of um, mystical being or something like that. He is a person. He is a personality. He can be hurt by us. And we need to recognize that Holy Spirit can be hurt by us. He can be grieved by us, by the way we live. And when we sin, we walk contrary. When we sin, we walk contrary to the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. We bring grief to Him by not walking in step with Him, not walking the way He wants us to live, not, 
not living in the way that the joy of God is going to flow through our beings because God is speaking through Holy Spirit, as our worship team sang earlier. We can make Holy Spirit intensely sad in our lives, sorrowful in our lives. And that's a powerful statement. It's a powerful warning to all of us. And I believe that's why Paul tells us here, do not grieve the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit represents the the relationship that we have with God, this ongoing relationship. He represents the personality in the Trinity that draws us towards Jesus Christ. And we're told in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 18, that we are to flee from sexual immorality and all other sins that are outside the body, but when we sin sexually, we sin against our own body. And then he says this, do, not, do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit? Our bodies are temples, dwelling places for the Holy Spirit, whom is in you who you have received from God. We are no longer our own. We are bought with a price. Therefore, Paul tells the Corinthian church to honor God with our bodies. It absolutely blows my mind to think that somehow this person, Dave Stewart, is a temple of the Holy Spirit. But that's the truth of Scripture. The moment that a person believes in Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit comes to dwell in them and they become a dwelling place for God's Spirit. In Romans chapter 8, God also reminds us through the words of Paul that it isn't just so that the Holy Spirit can come and live in us and and we can have a good time. God has a purpose for Holy Spirit coming and living in us and the purpose for that is that we can be conformed more to the image of Jesus Christ, His Son. So God has a distinct purpose for giving us the Holy Spirit. And so living contrary to the indwelling of the Holy Spirit is a sin. It's a great sin. It causes grief to the Holy Spirit. It causes grief to God. There are some facts that we need to be aware of as we think about Holy Spirit, just before we get more into our passage. The first is that once we place our trust in Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit dwells in us. I've already mentioned that, but in, first, in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 13 and 14, Paul says, having believed, you were marked, and having believed in Christ, you were marked in him with a seal. And that seal is the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession. And again, in Romans 8, 9, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. The moment that a person places their trust in Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit comes to live. The Holy Spirit comes to live in that person. It's a phenomenal concept. It's a beautiful concept. But it's a truth from the Bible that God has given to us. And what a privilege it has given to us when we think about God in dwelling. You know, the Old Testament believers were blessed because they had the voice of God and sometimes these images that like, you know, why doesn't God do that anymore? Well, he kind of does, but... Then we have Jesus Christ who is God in the flesh and we can see what God looks like in human skin and it's like, wow, that's... You know, the early... the, The disciples were so blessed because they had Jesus, you know, they could follow him and learn from him and they could walk around the streets with him. That would be amazing. We are so blessed because we have God living in us through the presence of the Holy Spirit. And that is such an honor that God has given and a privilege he has given to us. And it's a biblical fact. The secondly, we see in this, in this uh, chapter 4, verse 30, we also see that Holy Spirit has a role and that he seals our redemption for eternity. We can have complete trust that we will be Redeemed in the end. When Jesus comes again to receive us, we can have complete trust that we will be with God in heaven for eternity. Because why? Because the Holy Spirit seals us. The Holy Spirit seals us for that redemption. A third fact about the indwelling of the Holy Spirit is that because Holy Spirit dwells in us, and because we still battle and wrestle, as Paul mentions in Corinthians, we still battle and wrestle in our being, that we can grieve the Holy Spirit. And yet, 
even grieving against the Holy Spirit can be forgivable. Some people mistake the grief of the Holy Spirit and blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. They think they're the same thing, and they're not. Uh, Grieving the Holy Spirit is done by believers who have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit in them. The, The blasphemy against the Holy Spirit is done by unbelievers who do not have the Spirit of God in them. And so we have Jesus in Matthew chapter 12 Uh, when he is driving out demons, the the leaders of the day are coming to Jesus and they're saying, well, you're driving out demons. By what power are you doing that? You must be driving out demons by the power of the devil himself, by demons. And, And, you know, that is the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, to attribute to God something evil in his nature. And Jesus would go on to say that is unpardonable because you have become so hard in your hearts that you cannot recognize the holiness of God and instead you blame him and point him out to be evil. So grieving the Holy Spirit can be forgivable. It doesn't make it less serious, but it is not the same as blaspheming the Holy Spirit. So some of you might be sitting here thinking, okay, so if I have a Holy Spirit living in me and, and I sin against the Holy Spirit and I can ask for forgiveness, what, you know, what, what, what effect does that have? What impact does that have? Well, let's take a step back for a moment. The Holy Spirit is given to us by God to be a light. The Holy Spirit is given to us by God to have the impact and to be a light in our lives. First of all, in John chapter 16, we see that the Holy Spirit reveals and convicts us of our sin. He shines in the dark places of our... The places I don't want to go. The places we don't want to go. The Holy Spirit shines a light in those places and says, Hey Dave, wake up. See what's really happening here. Come to God and recognize your sinfulness. Come to God and ask for forgiveness. You see, the Holy Spirit has this beautiful role of showing us what we are blind to and revealing it to us. And for that, we need to be thankful. Also, the Holy Spirit is a light revealing the truth of God's word. We see and understand the truth of God's word through the power of the Holy Spirit. I can remember back years ago, I had just become a believer, 16 years of age. I knew nothing about the Bible, didn't know Old New Testament, knew nothing. I was, I was so ignorant. But I remember one night in my devotions going through Psalm 139. Fearfully and wonderfully made, knit in my mother's womb. And that beautiful passage just unfolding how deeply God knows us, how intimately he knows us. And I can remember having just an understanding of that passage and just in some presence of the Spirit in my life, he just broke it down for me and made me understand it. And then I remember a couple years later when I was at Bible college, a pastor came and spoke on the same verses and he broke it down the exact same way that this ignorant six-month-old Christian had understood it. And I was like, That's, I, I had no way of understanding that. But the Holy Spirit guided me in my understanding of Scripture. And the Holy Spirit does. As we encounter God's Word, I know we have all these wonderful helps in the Bible these days. We have ones that can you know, study Bibles, that can give us all the details and the background and everything of every passage. And those are great resources for us to use. But nothing will help us understand the Bible more than Holy Spirit. As we engage in God's word, we engage with the Holy Spirit. He he speaks to us. He reveals himself to us. He reveals Jesus Christ to us. And he becomes a light shining in our lives. In John chapter 16, the Holy Spirit reveals the glory of Jesus Christ, his life, his death, his resurrection. He draws us to Jesus And if we are in a habit of grieving him, it's like we're closing our eyes to that light. It's like we're we're turning off the light switch and we're in darkness and we're not understanding, we're not understanding the word of God. We're not understanding our own sin. We're blind to it and we don't understand the glory of Jesus. If we close our eyes to the light of the spirit, we will fail to see the glory that God has in Jesus Christ. We just won't see it. And that is why so many people, when they start to get into a sinful habit, a sinful way, that one of the first things they do is stop coming to church. They no longer see the value of it. They no longer see the importance of it. They stop reading their Bible and praying. When we grieve him, we refuse to see 
his direction, his purpose that God has in mind to show us. The Holy Spirit is a light for our lives. J.I. Packer, in one of his sermons, he talked about the Holy Spirit in this way. He says, it's as if I'm standing here, the Holy Spirit is behind me, shining his light over my shoulder. And the light is shining on Jesus Christ. And the Holy Spirit does not want us to turn around and look at the Holy Spirit. But the Holy Spirit always wants us to keep our focus on who Jesus is. To never lose sight of who Jesus is. To never lose sight of his love for us. To never lose sight of the glory that we see. To listen to him, to hear his voice. Packer goes on to say, to go to him and have life to get to know him and taste his gift of joy and peace. Packer goes on to describe it as if the Holy Spirit is the celestial matchmaker. (laughs) He's the spiritual matchmaker, bringing us to Jesus and ensuring that we stay with Jesus. I love that. The Holy Spirit is a matchmaker for us as we, the church, encounter the bride, encounters the groom, Jesus Christ. How many times in the book of Acts is it that the Spirit guides people? Constantly. If you read through the book of Acts, you see the Holy Spirit does so much. We see in, in, in Philip, in chapter 8, how he says to Philip, go to that chariot where the eunuch will be, and great things will happen there when he follows. In chapter 10, when Peter is approached by three men sent by Cornelius the centurion, and the Holy Spirit whispers to Peter, let them in, go and then follow them back to Cornelius. And Peter has no understanding of this, but Cornelius has already invited all of his family and his friends to his house, anticipating Peter will come. And Peter shows up and he preaches the gospel. And Cornelius' family and friends all become believers and are baptized because the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Paul and Barnabas, uh, Saul and Barnabas, are set apart for the ministry of Jesus Christ through the whispering of the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 13. In Acts chapter 16, the Holy Spirit prevents Paul and others from going into places and to preach the gospel. You know, I, I, would, I would just say, let's go everywhere and preach the gospel. But the Holy Spirit says, no, Paul, Barnabas, and others, I don't want you to go here. I want you to go here instead. I want you to go here instead. They're ready to hear the gospel. Holy Spirit continually guides the early church followers. And so he still guides us today. They were all dependent. They were all dependent on the leading of the Holy Spirit. And if not, ministry would miss. Ministry would not take place. And the same is true today. The Holy Spirit wants to guide us. Wants to guide us in the directions that we should go. And if we do not follow then ministry will not take place. Ministry will not happen. And the question is, are we, are we dependent upon the Spirit's leading? We've heard it said in, uh, from the pulpit and from other places that if the Spirit of God was to lead the church, would the church still gather together? Would it still meet together? And, uh, and sadly to say, many churches probably would continue to function just as is. Many churches would probably still function, still gather just because they can. But without the Holy Spirit, there is no point. The big picture in all of this passage, when we look at Ephesians chapter 4, the big picture, and that's why I went back to verse 17, the big picture is a comparison. There's beautiful comparisons. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 31, we see this this beautiful, uh, specific instructions as to what is grieving the Holy Spirit. But beyond that, before that, we see this whole statement about you, if you don't believe in the Holy Spirit, you know, don't be like the people who don't believe in the Holy Spirit. Instead, believe in the Holy Spirit. Don't keep the clothes on that you had on before you knew the Holy Spirit, but put off the old clothes and put on the new clothes. Put on the way of the Spirit in your life. And we see that big picture thing. And then in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 31, he breaks it down into some very specific sins that are grievous to the Holy Spirit. The first one is bitterness, which means sour speech or sour spirit. One author says it's an embittered or resentful spirit that refuses to be reconciled to another person. 
We might, in our language today, might call it holding a grudge against a believer and recognize that all of these things I'm about to speak to now address the relationship between believers, okay? This is how we are to treat one another as believers, not just in this church, as believers in Christ, whether it's in another country, whether it's across the world, whether it's wherever, how we treat other believers. And so we're to have no bitterness or sour speech, or we're not to hold a grudge against somebody. And some of us really battle with that. Some of us love to argue. Some of us love to fight. Some of us love to just get right in there. We just, you can't hold back. And there's a bitterness that grows from that. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 15 says that the root of bitterness defiles many. The root of bitterness defiles many. If we have bitterness in our hearts, it's never just going to stay in our hearts. We want to believe that it'll just stay there. But if there's a bitterness in our life, maybe God hasn't treated us the way we expect. Maybe God hasn't done the things that we expect him to do and we hold a bitterness against God. Maybe we look at another believer and we hold a bitterness against them. Maybe they aren't deserving of whatever and we hold a bitterness against them. And that grieves the Holy Spirit. And it spreads. It never just stays in our own being. It spreads. That bitter spirit spreads. So specifically here, Paul warns about grieving the Holy Spirit of bitterness. He also warns of of grieving the Holy Spirit through wrath or anger. Wrath or anger kind of are like an active or a passive hostility. You know, you you can be very angry but passively not, you know, passively not express it, but you still are very angry. Or you could be wrathful and really express it, and we have maybe examples of the, that in our lives with people that we know. But wrath and anger, that quiet, or passion, uh, that quiet or active hostility causes the Holy Spirit great distress because we are treating one another in a way that God should not be treated, in the way that others who have the indwelling of the Spirit should not be treated. He goes on to talk about clamor or brawling. It's when you raise your voice or screaming and shouting, I don't think, I can't think, I don't think we've had that here in my experience here in 20 years. I can't remember a time where one of us has been actually getting up and yelling and screaming at another believer. I think I would remember that. But I do know it does happen in churches. I do know that it does happen in the lives of some believers, and it grieves the Holy Spirit. Who are we to yell at one another when we have been equally forgiven, we have been equally sanctified, when we are equally under the the care of our God? He goes on to talk about another one, slander. He says slander is speaking evil of other believers, and we might say, oh, I'd I'd never do that, but let me just challenge us to think. One of the struggles that happens in church is gossip. Is that slanderous? Most often. When we're gossiping about somebody else or telling a story about how they behaved and uh, no, no, that was pretty questionable and we start spreading that around and behind the scenes, that gossip, that, that's hurtful, it's slanderous. It's not building each other up like the scriptures tell us to do. We need to be careful that we don't use slander or gossip, that we don't speak evil of other people to other people. When people that we know in the church or beyond the church, when we, in the bigger realm of Christianity, we see them sin, we shouldn't be, oh, did you see what so-and-so, you know? There's no room for that. That's where we exercise the grace and the forgiveness of God, who has exercised it in our lives with us. And finally, malice is identified here as well. Malice, which is plotting evil against other believers. And I, you know, this, this, is, this is, it's almost like these things are growing. You know, it starts here and it ends in malice. Where you actually are actively going out and causing pain to other believers. There is no place for these horrible things in the Christian community called the church. There is no place for these things in the life of believers as we are in relationship with one another. And that is emphasized so strongly by when we look at the passage right after it, in verse 32, we see how, we see these beautiful qualities that come up. And these qualities all point us to Jesus Christ. Don't be be mistaken. These qualities are, again, a contrast. Don't do these six things. 
but be like this. Anything that is against the quality of Jesus Christ. And they are identified here. And how do we know they're identified here? Because in verse 32, it wraps up by saying, be forgiving as God has forgiven us through Jesus Christ. But we also know because in verse 32, the word for kindness is translated krestos. That's the word used for verse 32. Be kind to one another. Be krestos to one another. Now for us, we're like, okay, whatever. But to the minds of the believers at the time, the Greek word for krestos is awfully similar to the Greek word for Christ, which is Christos. And so for the believers in the day who understand the Greek language, who are hearing this, be krestos, be like Christ in your kindness to other people. In Luke chapter 6, verses 35 and following, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus Christ instructs his disciples to be kind. To be kind even to those who are ungrateful, those who are selfish. Be kind to those who demand you give them some of your clothing. Give them even more. To those who need money, give them and don't expect any money back. To those who hurt you, they, they turn the cheek to them. Don't respond back with hatred, but instead be kind. That is the kindness of Jesus Christ that we see in the Gospels, in his life. And anything that is against that is grievous to God and his spirit. Secondly, we see that there's a compassion of Christ, and he says, be compassionate to one another. The compassion, the tender heartedness that Jesus showed when he saw in Matthew chapter 9 the people who were without a leader. They were without a leader. No shepherd. And Jesus said, I have compassion on them because they are sheep with no one to lead them. Jesus had great compassion on people. He didn't often judge people, actually, even though he is the judge. He didn't often judge people, but he had compassion on people for their lostness, for their hurt, for their humanity. Jesus had great compassion. And I wonder today, sometimes we are lacking some of that compassion. In church, sometimes we are lacking that compassion in our dealing with other people. A third thing that he says in this chapter 4, verse 32, is that we need to practice forgiveness, the forgiveness that, that we see in Jesus forgiving us, the acting in grace that God has acted in grace with us. And these are the things that we are to measure our life with. We are to put off these these six things, this bitterness, this wrath, this fighting, clamor, this slander. We are to put off all this gossip and malice. We are to put all that stuff off, and we are to put on Jesus, on the kindness, the compassion, and the forgiveness of our God. It is true that grieving the Holy Spirit is forgivable, But it has impact. It has impact. And we are all guilty at some point of the sin of grieving the Holy Spirit. We all are. If we have not grieved the Holy Spirit, then then there is no need for our forgiveness. It could be through our bad thoughts. It could be through our laziness. It could be through lying or gossiping. It could be through idolatry, whether it's with self-idolization or whether it's idolizing other people. We, we could do it through our pride, our violence, our profanity, but all of these sins are forgivable. They are all forgivable. And we need to walk away from this recognizing that the Holy Spirit will shine his light into our lives and reveal these sins. But when he does, we need to deal with them. We need to take responsibility for them if we are going to be the church that God wants us to be. How do we do that? Well, there's this beautiful image. Put off the old, put on the new. And in between that, there's this wonderful statement about putting on the attitude that will honor God. One uh, C.H. Spurgeon years and years ago used this illustration, and I'll use it again because he was really good. He said, this glass has, has, uh, has some water in it, has some air in it. So if I was going to ask you as people, how do you take the air out of the glass? Well, you just put like a hose and you can suck the air out of it. Except that if it's not a sealed glass, 
then other air will just come in and fill that. So if the air represents sin in our lives, there's really, it's not easy for us to get rid of it. But here's what you'd have to do. You'd have to put a seal on it. Then you can put a hose in there, and you can suck out the air and get rid of all the air, get rid of all the sin, right? And that sounds like good work, except that, physically speaking, what will happen is if you suck the air out of that glass, the glass will actually shatter because it will, what is it, not combust, it'll implode. Thank you, Paul. It'll implode because you, you haven't replaced it with anything. You've just tried to suck the bad out, but, there's, but you can't do that because it'll just bust on you. So that's why in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18, we are told that we need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. The only way to rid sin in our lives is to be filled with the Holy Spirit, who will be poured into our life with increasing measure and will push out the sinfulness. The closer we draw to the Spirit, the further we draw away from sin. We need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. It is not our own doing. It is the work of God in our lives. If we want to stop grieving the Holy Spirit, we need to first of all cry out to the Holy Spirit to cleanse us and to fill us. In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18. We cannot excuse our sinfulness. We cannot excuse it. God has made the way for us to be excused. God has made the way for us to be forgiven. And God has given us his Holy Spirit as a seal, a seal, a promise, a guarantee that we will be redeemed. When Jesus Christ comes to claim his own, we will be redeemed for eternity. What a beautiful, beautiful promise of Scripture. At the rapture, when Jesus comes in the cloud and and we're kind of prepared, but not really prepared, because we're never going to be really prepared, but when he comes to claim those he, he knows, we will be caught up with him in the clouds. We will be sealed for eternity in the presence of God by the work of the Holy Spirit. So yes, grieving the Holy Spirit is forgivable, but it is also so important that we take responsibility for it in our lives. We come to God and we ask him for forgiveness. We try with the help of our other believers, we try by allowing him to shine the light in the word of God, to shine the light on Jesus, to shine the light on our sin, that we can walk in step with the Holy Spirit. We can be in step with God's spirit. That's his desire for us. Be in the spirit, be filled with the Spirit. God wants us to treat each other the way that we would treat Him. With the Spirit dwelling inside of each other, treat each other the way that we would treat Him. With love and compassion, with with forgiveness, treat each other in a way that will honor God who is living in us in spirit. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your word to us today. God, I thank you so much that you are our great God. And Lord, you love us beyond what we can understand. Lord, we thank you for the gift of your Holy Spirit that you give us. As we believe in you, as we place our trust in you, Lord, you guide us as the counselor enters into our life and blesses us. God, we thank you for your Holy Spirit. Heavenly Father, teach us how to walk in sync with your spirit. Help us, God, to throw off the sinfulness in our lives that comes so easily. Help us, God, to not be proud and believe that we are without sin. Help us, God, to to come before you and to love you with everything we have, sacrificing ourselves for you, offering our lives for you, Lord, so that we can see your spirit moving within us. As we submit to you, God, may your spirit shine through us and shine your light on Jesus Christ, your Son. God, be with us, we pray. Thank you for this day. Thank you for this, for this uh, word that we have heard from you this morning, Lord. May it bless us, and may it grow us in our faith and knowledge and understanding of you. And we pray this in his name. Amen. Amen, amen. Thank you, Pastor Dave.
great word and a great challenge for all of us. Well, as we go to prayer, um, I'm not sure what kind of a week you've had, uh, but you know the kind of week you've had. Maybe you've had a great week, an amazing week. Maybe your week hasn't been so good. As you look at the news and listen to the news, you know it's been a terrible week as you think about the world. As you think about a tornado ripping through Barrie, hundreds of houses. I don't think there was a life lost, thankfully. But you think about a mom and a daughter in a drowning accident in Muskoka. You can think about, and that was a tragedy. That was a tragedy. It should never happen. You think about the flooding in Europe. Okay, so we've seen all the pictures. Hundreds, if not thousands, uh, homes, lives, and just a mess. You think about, like there's so many things you think about uh, throughout the week. And in some ways, uh, if you're sort of like attuned to what's happening in people's lives, you, you, sort of, you grieve with those people. And there have been griefs. Uh, Lee Beauchamp lost a cousin, a, 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 a 60-year-old man uh, who she was pretty close to. And, and she's grieving the loss of David, her, her cousin. And so there's, there's grief. And, and yet in the midst of all of that, we have life. And there's celebrating going on. And there's birthdays. And, and there's times away with family. So when we think about... Uh, coming aside for a moment, I just want to just give you these verses and then we'll pray. And there's many things in the prayer list. Let me encourage you to read the prayer list. Uh, we got a, gr a great prayer calendar every week from uh, Nicole up in Hope Awaits. Uh, I'll read that in a minute. But let's remember this from Psalm 99. The Lord reigns. Let the nations tremble. He sits enthroned between the cherubim. Let the earth shake. Great is the Lord in Zion. He is exalted over all the nations. Let them praise your, name, your great and awesome name. He is holy. So in the midst of whatever we see or hear or experience, uh, let us remember that God is great. Amen? He is holy. He loves you with an everlasting love. Nothing can ever separate us from the love of God. There's nothing to fear in this world. Nothing to fear in this world but God. So there's some great things in Scripture. Let me remind you of that. As you look through your prayer list, you'll just notice different things. So I just want to, to keep you uh, aware of all of those things. What Nicole asks us to pray for on Sunday, pray for one of our clients as he tries to connect with a lawyer to help with some legal matters. Pray that he would get the right lawyer who can help him. And she has a beautiful list of very specific prayer requests. And there are prayer requests as we remember Christine facing her appendectomy this week on Tuesday, so we'll remember Christine. There are others who are dealing with, as we think about Morgan, and as we think about others dealing with cancer and chemo, and we need to keep lifting them up. Uh, Bill and Bev Smith have a granddaughter named Katie, also with a brain tumor and an MRI, and there's great concerns for Katie's life, just 14 years old as we think about faith. I mean, there's lots of things. But God is great, isn't he? And we can take it all to the Lord. Let's just take it to the Lord. So let's, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for who you are. That you are great. You are awesome. That you are sovereign in a, in a world that's breaking down faster than we care to admit. In a world that's absolutely crazy. In a world where we see brokenness in, in not just in what's happening in nature, but in pandemic, in disease, whether it's cancer or whether it's some other illness. Lord, in, in just brokenness all around us, tornadoes, floods, hurricanes. Uh, Lord, we see this brokenness, and yet you are the Lord. And you tell us, do not be afraid. So, Lord, we, we sit here, we stand here as Harmony Road Baptist Church, and we want to say to you, Lord, we're not afraid. We know that you are God. You are awesome. You are holy. Forgive us when we doubt you. Forgive us, Lord, when we don't believe in you. Forgive us, Lord, when we allow the world to create a fear within us of anything and everything, and yet we're not afraid of you. So, God, forgive us. And may we be people who do not grieve the Holy Spirit, but we allow the Holy Spirit to remind us constantly, be aware constantly of who you are, how great you are, how amazing you are. Thank you for the words of Pastor Dave today. And thank you that you're a forgiving God. And yes, Lord, we ask that you would forgive us for not living the way we ought or thinking the way we ought or living the way we ought as believers in, in faith, in trust. 
And so, God, I would pray that you would help each one of us in this sanctuary. Lord, help everyone who's watching online. Lord, that we just admit, Lord, I am weak, but you are strong. I feel poor, but you are rich. You make me rich. Lord, even when I'm unsure, I've had my confidence in you because you are sovereign. You're the rock. So, God, forgive us when we doubt. Forgive us, Lord, when we allow the world to just cave in on us. And we go, woe is me. How terrible my life is. Oh, God, forgive us. God, thank you that we can take all of our prayer concerns to you. Every, every person who's on our list. We'll start with ourselves and ask you to forgive us of our sin, Lord. Forgive us. As Dave has reminded us again, Lord, we just need to come to you and ask, oh, God, forgive us of our sin. Cleanse us of all unrighteousness, of not thinking right and, and not being right. But trusting you, Lord, that's what we wanted to trust you with all of our heart. But Lord, we also lay all of our burdens on you because you care for us. You tell us to draw unto you, draw to come to you, draw closer to you, to rest in you, to abide in you. Forgive us, Lord, when we don't. And God, you know every need. You know the need of those loved ones who need to come to Christ. And Lord, that's always on the top of our list. That's the nearest thing on our hearts. Those brothers, those sisters, those parents, God, those close friends, our neighbors, people we love, but they don't know you and they ignore you. They live life like you're not even there. Oh God, we just pray for the salvation of loved ones. That somehow, through our example, through our words, through our own testimony, Lord, that we can show them Jesus. That they would want Jesus. That that you, as we pray for them, Lord, the Holy Spirit would convict and break through that heart and bring that heart to Christ. Oh, Lord, we just pray for unsaved loved ones. We pray for those, Lord, who, who, Lord, need your strength. As we think of others, as I just think about this list, as I think about Lee... And those who grieve today, Lord, may they know the great comfort and strength of God who loves them. For the grieving people all over the world who are grieving. For Morgan and Janet and others dealing with Linda, dealing with chemotherapies that rivet through their bodies, Lord, and cause them pain and discomfort. Lord, give them strength, comfort them, heal them with your mighty power. We pray for healing. Lord, we just, I remember Christine this week facing her surgery. May she be strong. May she not be afraid. May she know that she's being covered by the blood of Jesus, and we are praying for her. We're praying for good results for Karen, who's facing a biopsy this week. For Jen, you know, for the memorial service for her dad, whom she loves. So we pray for Jen Warner and her family this week. We continue to pray for Bill and Bev, for their granddaughter, Katie, for Noreen at home, and for Linda, for ongoing treatments. And as Karen and has been ministering to Tracy. We thank you, Lord, that Tracy has received Jesus as her Savior, that Tracy is ready to go home. But maybe even through her love, even as she responds to her family, may something be radiant about Tracy's life that will influence and impact the rest of her family. Even now, she's preparing to go home to be with you. So God, be with Tracy, and thank you for Karen's faithfulness this week and others. Thank you, God, for your working in us. Thank you for Nicole and the ministries of Hope Awaits and Gate 316, the refuge, and all these ministries to homeless and brokenness and those who are suffering in our world. Bless them, encourage them, lift them up, and may we, Lord, the strong, do it all that we can, whether in our own lives or in our giving or in our support. Lord, support those ministries that need help. Thank you, God, for your great love to us today. Thank you so much. Continue to bless us through this service. Continue to find us faithful here at Harmony. Lord, as we, uh, as we do all that we can do, thank you for the work of VBS. And thank you for Sylvia. And she just is so thankful, Heavenly Father, for the, for the many families that were a part and the many volunteers who helped. Oh, God, thank you. Continue to bless those who've heard the word this week. Thank you, Father. Be with all of our families, those who are home, those who are on vacation. May those who be near water, may they be careful. And thank you. Thank you, God, for your faithfulness. Because you are a great and holy God, and we love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Lots to pray for. Now, there's a bit of an announcement, a few announcements. And uh, I'm going to ask, there's there's this amazing couple in our church called Andrew and Kate. 
And if you don't know them, I'm going to get them to stand up right now so you know who they are. Andrew and Kate, can I see their, your faces, please? I just want to make sure it's, it is. Okay, good. Thank you very much. Okay, it's Andrew and Kate, okay? So, uh, so just a word to Andrew and Kate. Uh, this is for their bands to marriage. They're getting married on, on July the 31st. Notice is hereby given of the intended marriage of Kate Donato and Andrew Pava, both of Oshawa. The marriage will take place at Harmony Road Baptist Church. That's here on Saturday, July the 31st. Any persons who believe they have just cause why these two people should not marry are asked to speak to the officiating pastor. That would be me or Abden Hood of Harmony Road Baptist Church by Sunday, July the 18th, 2021, or forever hold their peace. All right. God bless you. Good to see you too. Thank you so much. Now, just a couple of other quick things. It is, there was a great praise item for the VBS. So Sylvia just reached out to Dave and I to say over 45 families were a part of our VBS. There were two families uh, from Fort McMurray, Alberta, who were part of our VBS. How do you like that? What you can do virtually. And so we continue to pray, you know, that the message of the gospel would just continue to extend to all these families. And thank you to Sylvia. Thank you to the many volunteers who helped. Also, thank you notes for those who were involved in the, sh the shower for uh, Caitlin and Carlos. The drive, it was, it was a drive through right, on Thursday. And there are some thank you notes on the, on the front desk there for those people who were part of that. There's also going to be a drive through shower for Rebecca Chant. That's going to be July the 31st before the wedding. Okay, so okay, just you got that. Monday nights, so uh, Monday nights, we're doing six of these services. So we've had one, and we went to the Southeast Asian Islands. Uh, pretty powerful stuff going on in Singapore and other areas where the gospel is being reached. This, uh, tomorrow night, the service, What in the World is God Doing? We're be going, we'll be going to Albania, Kosovo, and Montenegro. Now, if that does anything to your body, it should. A horrible, horrible place in the world as we think about Eastern Europe and what happened. And it wasn't tribal, but it was almost tribal. It was ethnic. And it was terrible, like the murders that were going on. So anyway, the gospel in this very difficult place, the gospel is now going back into those countries in like almost families that were seeing each other but were against each other. And now God is doing a great healing. So if you want to come, that's Monday night, 7 o'clock, a bold advance, uh, another Macedonian call to action and a reminder the gospel still shakes the gates of hell. Amen. The gospel. So if you can come, come. And, and, and just as a bit of a feeder, next Sunday, if you want to go to heaven, make sure you come to church. But I also need to say if you want to go to hell, also come to church next Sunday. So I guess you just kind of put it together, okay? So we're going to be talking about Sheol, Hades, heaven, paradise, Abraham's bosom, and judgment. So that's all going to be next week. These questions, Dave and I are looking at some of the questions you've given us, and we're going like, whoa. I mean, I'm not even sure if we're capable, but we'll do our best. And uh, Dave gave a great message today on the grieving of the Holy Spirit. Okay, if there's any more announcements, I forget them. So uh, I'm going to ask. We have a video. That's right, we have a video. Let's watch the video. Trust in you, Jesus, you're all, you're all, you're all that we need. Your power will pull us through. We're trusting in you. We're trusting in you. You give us hope and life that's forever. You make us bold and we stand together. Your power will pull us through. We're trusting in you. We're trusting. journey there's no looking back with jesus to lead us we're on the right track oh, 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 oh. wide open spaces for wide open eyes we're looking ahead for the next big surprise oh, 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 oh. We trust, we trust, we to Sylvia and, uh, and Liam for helping and others who helped out to make this year's VBS uh, so 
Oh, wonderful. Two years in a row now virtual. Let's not go for three. But it is amazing that God is reaching out even through this media form to reach people and bring people uh, into his presence. So thank you, Sylvia. Thank you for all those who are involved. Uh, worship team, you come on up and lead us in our closing song today. So this is a very familiar hymn. Um, so as we separate one from another, I just pray that the Lord will lead you, that the Holy Spirit will lead you, that you will have a voice, that you will have an ear listening to him. Like all of us have difficulties in our lives, and we will always do. Jesus said in this world, we will have trouble. He also said to take heart because he has already overcome the world. So I just pray for you today and for the rest of the week that you will be led by the Holy Spirit. He leadeth me, O oh blessed thought, O oh words with heavenly comfort fraught. Whate'er I do, where'er I be, still tis God's hand that leadeth me.
Thank you, Karen. Thank you, worship team. One of the beautiful images we have in God's word of our relationship with Jesus is as a marriage ceremony. Uh, we had a marriage ceremony last week in the Stewart family. Our, our oldest daughter, Alexandra, got married to Mark, and it was a great honoring, God-honoring celebration. We are thankful for these two who believe and follow the Lord that have connected together and are now committing for life, and we are thankful for that. But it just made me remember. Yeah, thank you, Lord. Um, and, it just, and it just made me remember that beautiful, we were thinking about, he leadeth me. That beautiful image we have at the end of Revelation, in Revelation chapter 19. Hallelujah. There's going to be millions of people around screaming out, shouting out, Hallelujah. For the Lord God Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory. For the wedding of the Lamb has come, and his bride, his church, us, those who believe, have made themselves ready. Fine linen, bright and clean, was given for his bride to wear. Fine linen because of the righteous acts that God has empowered them to do. And then the angel said to me, write down this. Blessed are those who invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. We have this to look forward to, this wedding supper with Jesus, enjoying him as the groom, as we are his bride. Uh, let's remember that and keep that in our minds as we go to live for God this week. Uh, he is our life, uh, life soulmate. He is the one who we are going to be with for eternity. He is uh, our, uh, the one who loves us beyond what we can understand. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for, Lord, giving us your spirit so that um, as your son Jesus, uh, Lord, promised that he could be our counselor, our guide. Lord, the relationship that uh, you want us to have with your spirit is pure and holy. We pray, God, that we will honor you with our lives. Lord, that we will come before you and offer ourselves to you new, fresh, every day. And we will keep our eyes open for the glory that we see of Jesus Christ in each moment of each day. God, thank you so much for blessing us today. And we pray, Lord, a blessing over your church here at Harmony. God, guide us and direct us through your spirit. Uh, Lord, teach us the way to go. Lead us, Lord, by your hand, that we may honor and glorify you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for joining us and continue to join us again. Just a reminder that if you want to make sure that you have room here to register to sign up just so that we have you uh, down and we know what to anticipate. But uh, you're always welcome to join us online as well. And so just thank you for coming. Thank you for being with us this week. God bless you and have a great week.